thank you so much everyone for tuning in live. My name is Stacey Hackett. I work with the amazing um, Embody Lab. This is the Mind Body Therapy um, Summit for 2021. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, our next session is with the amazing um, Stacey Hines. Um, so we are going to be with her for the next um, 90 minutes. Um, it is the, the session is called Trauma Healing and Social Change. Um, so Stacey Hines is the author of The Politics of Trauma, Somatics Healing and Social Justice. She is a national leader in the field of somatics and she specializes in intersect, intersecting personal and social change. So yeah, we are with Stacey for the next 90 minutes. Thank you so much for being here, Stacey. Um, and I am going to pass it on to you. Thank you, Stace. Um, it's great that we have the same, same name. You know, there's I, I haven't had the experience of there being a lot of Stacys. So nice to meet you and nice to be with you on this. Um, <clears throat> thank you, everyone, and welcome to your first day. You know, if you've been at other sessions, I hope it's been going great. And I'm very much looking forward to our hour and a half together. Um, I am going to make a request for those of you who are willing to come on to video. I love seeing your faces and I love getting to interact. So I don't kind of stare at speaker view the whole time. I square at the like all the little squares. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see your house um, or wherever you're sitting. <laughs> We're getting used to each other's houses. <clears throat> um, but thank you. <clears throat> um, just nice to see you. It's one of the reasons that I also leave the chat on is there'll be places where <clears throat> we might do a practice. Um, I'm actually going to do a demo during this session. And it's a place where we can have a little bit of collective interaction rather than a 90 minute speech, which I could do, but it's just not my style. Cool. <clears throat> All right. I also don't have PowerPoint slides. Um, I have a couple of slides I will show you, but I'm going to orient toward practice and interactivity and, and Q&A and all of that. So as we get in, I'm sure you all know Zoom very well at this point, um, but I love to use a raise hand function. Um, there'll be places where I'll chat a little bit about things and then do a Q&A. And if you can raise your hand, it becomes very obvious who's raised their hands, which is a little bit easier than me presenting and tracking chat. So we'll use a raise hand and I also will keep my eye on the chat. All right, welcome. Welcome from all over from what it sounded like and looked like on the chat. Um, I am sitting in uh, Oakland, California, which is a lonely land. And I have been out on the, the left coast as we call it here in the US for about 30 years. <clears throat> and um, uh, just happy to be here. One of my favorite parts of Zoom is that we can gather from so many places that otherwise aren't really possible and just the quality of accessibility that can happen. So welcome. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to start out with, so, so Stacy, the other Stacy, um, talked about the topic. We're really going to be looking at <clears throat> this intersection between personal and systemic or social change. And when we're really looking at a mind body or a somatic approach, really unpacking kind of beyond our immediate or our family systems experiences to how we're shaped by community, institutions, social norms, and how we actually embody them, even when we don't agree with them. So whether you're a one-on-one -on -one practitioner, or whether you work with teams or you do social change work, <clears throat> this should be relevant to you. Um, but that's what we're gonna do is just really go on this span from like, how do we embody the social and economic conditions in which we're soaking, even when we might not agree with them? And how do <clears throat> stressors, <clears throat> traumas, places where we have social privilege and places where we're socially oppressed, how do those actually just get so deep into us that they're part of our tissues and they're part of our nervous system and they're part of what our survival strategies are built out of. That's really what we're unpacking today. So of course, I'm gonna posit in the big picture that personal transformation or healing and social change are different processes, but that they're actually inseparable. 
Okay, that's kind of where we're going. And then you guys, y'all can agree, not agree, discuss, right? We can just dive in together. All right, <clears throat> so I am gonna start with just sharing an image of really <clears throat> my and our understanding of somatics. Um, Cause I, I feel like mind, body and somatics is kind of starting to blow up right now. And I feel like there, <laughs> there are about a thousand different definitions of it. So I'm gonna be sharing here <clears throat> mine. I'm just gonna share my screen. <clears throat> This is a, a model um, of what I would call embodied transformation, which is another way to name somatics. Like what is somatics? It's a holistic way to transform our sense of self, how we relate, our actions, right? And from our point of view in this methodology, all the, of that is aligned with, we wanna to transform toward who and what we most care about, right? And of course we care about things very intimate. And also I think we care about things that are really big like the future of the planet or racial equity, right? So we really start with this question of what do you care about? What's important to you? What are you longing for? So when we look at embodied transformation which um, I also think of that is it's sustainable. Once transformation or change has been embodied it means it's the kind of new natural but it's sustainable, we can act on it over time, even under pressure, right? And under different pressures, whether they're very personal or collective, like we've lived in the collective pressure of a global pandemic for a year and a half now, and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. You know, I'm kind of relaxing my body into going, we're five years, it's five years global pandemic, it's just gonna be shifting, right? Um, <clears throat> but, um, Inside of that, like how do we uh, change in a way that becomes new actions aligned with what we care about, even under the same old pressures, okay? So let me point to this a little bit. You'll see in the middle, we have somatic awareness, somatic opening, and somatic practices. These are all core components of an embodied approach to transformation. Somatic awareness is... <clears throat> often what people learn or use first. And that is, um, what am I sensing and feeling? What's happening in the sensation and the information coming from, in some ways, the neck down, or maybe the thinking self down. And somatic awareness is very important because what it does is it connects us into the intelligence that comes through sensation. I often think of that as our base level language that there's information that comes through sensation. It kind of comes up into emotional information and then it comes into thinking information, right? So all of those are connected, mind, heart, gut, we might say, <clears throat> but sensation, somatic awareness is really key. Somatic practices. So somatic practices are purposeful practices we take on to move us toward the things that we care about most. So any practice that's an embodied practice has a purpose, like for the sake of what am I practicing this? And, you know, many of us, <clears throat> a practice that we need to learn or relearn is a practice of boundaries. How do I have a centered boundary that takes care of me and also takes care of the people on the other side of my boundary? Or consent. I can think of hardly anyone in my last 20 years of work who had a deeply embodied ability to consent even under high pressure, because it's not what our social conditions teach us, right? Our social conditions are teaching us something very different. So we think of those things as practices, like what are embodied skills um, <clears throat> that I need, want, or that we need, want, that align with what we care about. Um, I'm going to say more about that, and we're actually going to do a practice today, too. That third circle is somatic opening, and basically what we mean by that is that there is patterning that gets remembered and lodged into our tissues and our musculature and our neuronal pathways. And you all know that our neuronal pathways go over our entire body. They're not just in our brains, right? We have a whole body nervous system, and there are neuronal communicators in our heart, 
there's neuronal communicators in our guts. Um, so when we're talking nervous system patterning, it is definitely in the, the repeated neuronal pathways of the brain. It's also in other organs. It's also in our tissues and our muscle memory. So we're gonna talk a lot about this today. There are certain patterns or conditioning or survival strategies that were really, really effective and important at one point, and they no longer serve us and we can't not do them. So somatic opening is part of how we work with and open those patterns and start to let them move and change and become different practices. So I'm gonna do a, dem a demo today with one of you, hopefully who will volunteer um, <clears throat> about how do we work with somatic opening. So <clears throat> the last two rings you can see is all of those somatic processes are interconnected, but they live inside of our social context. And that means our social norms, right? Who and what is considered the norm um, inside of our global economy. Um, inside of our global interaction with the natural world of which we're a part. And <clears throat> at least in many Western traditions, kind of coaching or even therapy can often end at the individual or the family system. And what's important in, in what we'll talk about today is we don't end there. We are shaped by our social context and we shape back. Yeah, so we're going to play with that and it's in the core model of how we understand somatics. And then last but not least, as you all see, there's landscape and spirit. And I'm going to stop sharing because you've seen it long enough. But landscape and spirit are things beyond human, right? They're not homocentric, they're not human centric, that still shape us. So land, landscape. Right, it is very recent in human history that we're not in deep relationship with the land. And some of us still are, some of us aren't. <clears throat> but when we think about land, if you live and grew up in an area that's more swampy, or you lived and grew up at the ocean, or you lived and grew up in the mountains, it, it, it shapes us, it gets inside of us. Um, the other great thing is in a lot of the research around resilience, and then in our work around resilience, land and relationship to nature and land is a very big resilience factor cross-culturally, okay? So land and our relationship to land is important. And then spirit, please call it whatever makes sense to you. Um, basically you call it the mystery, the ever expanding universe, um, God that isn't too anthropomorphized, um, but it's like, there's this vastness that we are connected to and that influences us. Um, you know, we are literally made of stardust because that's where carbon came from, <laughs> right? Uh, stars hitting the, the planetary bodies. So um, that is a model and body transformation takes and considers all of that. And I think at this point in somatics being more widely used and understood, what feels important to say is somatic awareness is only one part of embodied transformation, right? So becoming more aware of our sensations and the information is essential. But if we don't shift our practices, we won't change in an embodied way, yeah? If we don't uproot survival strategies that have been lodged inside of us, we also don't change in a sustainable way or an embodied way, okay? So all those components are important, okay? All right, that's a bit of a framework for us before I really dive into um, <clears throat> safety, belonging, and dignity, um, which are three things that somatics and the lineage I'm a part of hold as core human needs, right? The need for safety and safety for the people we identify with and love. Belonging, that we're considered part of the community and not held outside of belonging. It's actually very traumatizing for us to be unbelonged, very traumatizing. 
And then dignity. And what I mean by that is a, a sense of being dignified, having agency, um, uh, having, uh, having and being reflected as having worth, okay? Safety, belonging, and dignity are constitutive or inherent needs for human beings. And when we don't have those or we're not granted those by our social systems, it is deeply impactful for us. And um, <clears throat> depending on the longevity of it and the intensity of it, it can be traumatizing for us. So I just wanna connect this for a minute to our world. So to me, it is not a mistake that this very powerful and visionary call of Black Lives Matter, which has gone global and is totally relevant to the United States and our social conditions, Black Lives Matter is saying, right, that dignity, belonging, and safety is relevant for Black people, for folks of African descent, in a country that has not granted that in the social norms and the economic situation, yeah? And it's resonant, it's simple, and it's so deep because it is pointing to that, right? It's pointing to the belonging, to the dignity and the safety, yeah? We can look at other social movements that are really talking about, I mean, in fact, most social movements are looking at redignifying a whole group of people who've not been granted dignity by the social norms and the economy, right? It is looking at fighting, finding safety for whole groups of people who've not been granted that. Again, by the social conditions and economy, we can look at labor rights movements. We can look at indigenous movements. It's like safety, belonging, dignity in the broader social fabric and in the economy. Yeah. So thus these connections, right? The connections of what shapes and traumatizes or impacts us as human beings. And then what do these broader social rules have to do with that? Okay. Safety, belonging, dignity. All right. I'm going to pause for a minute because we're going to kind of dive in deeper from here, but I'd love to either in chat or if you want to raise your hand. Um, anything that you want to add or ask around somatics, what embodied transformation is, or really this, this initial dive into safety, belonging, and dignity? And just you can go to the reactions button, and under that, you can do the raise hand, and feel free to raise your hand. What's this body transformation women's movement, right? Another movement, uh, immigrants rights movements, right? Any place we find people being pushed out of safety, belonging and dignity, we're gonna find a movement. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, Shauna here that says, claiming dignity for ourselves, no longer waiting for a resistance system to come around. So this is really, really beautiful said, beautifully said. Um, there's a great, I'm sure many of you saw it, but during quarantine, there was a, a choir that was recording and putting stuff out of our Zoom. And, um, oh God, their name just fell out of my mind. I'll come back to it, but they, they do a beautiful, beautiful song about, you know, <clears throat> the world, it's, it's not the world's decision whether I'm loved. It's not the world's decision whether I have dignity. It's a beautiful piece. And we live inside of social conditions. So that internal work of reclaiming our dignity, our belonging, there's deep internal work to do there and transformation that can happen there. And we're still in dynamic participation with social conditions that are still affecting us. Yeah. All right. So I am going to, are there some societies that are better in providing safety, belonging, and dignity of their members across culture and history? That is one of the questions I've asked my whole life. <laughs> and yes, they are. <clears throat> um, 
not really post-industrial societies. And I'm not gonna go into this because we can talk about it for the whole rest of the time. But there are examples of how human beings have formed into communities that are really based much more on equity and much more on a profound and interdependent relationship with the planet. And these show up in the geological records, like societies where very little is invested in weapons and walls. Um, <clears throat> and you'll see it in a number of, not all, but a number of uh, indigenous traditions, especially those that really center um, a creatrix or, or a, a a creator that is seen as female. So yes, human society has done more of a power with organization rather than a power over organization. Um, it, is, it is a potential in us. <laughs> yeah. All right, folks, um, let's continue on here. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about what happens in our Soma. So I'm going to say soma instead of body. And why I'm going to say that is I want to deobjectify the body. Like the body isn't this thing that carries us around to our next conversation or our next meeting. Right? We are live changing dynamic organisms. Right? We're an animal on the planet, like a lot of other animals on the planet. And we have a lot of things that are unique about us, like language and a certain kind of complexity. But we're organisms. We're not a thing that thinks. Okay, so when I say soma, I mean our thinking. I mean, I mean our emotions. I mean how we relate. And I mean our actions. Okay, so by soma, I'm going, it's the whole whole, it's the whole of us, um, not just a body that we check in with periodically, okay? <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about how we are impacted by life and particularly by stress. So <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to call it two things. Um, all of us develop what we call condition tendencies. So that means adaptations to safety, belonging, and dignity that seem to work, that then generalize in our soma or generalize in our mind body. Okay, so condition tendencies are adaptations to safety, to belonging, to dignity. We started these really early on and it continues, right? Adaptations that then generalize in the mind body or in the soma. So <clears throat> can just give you a, maybe some of you will relate and you can kind of pop it in the chat if you do, but there's some of us where under pressure, our adaptation is to back up. I'm gonna disengage, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna to stand to the side and observe for a while. But it becomes a generalized adaptation that under pressure our style is to make space, make space or back up or even disconnect, right? And a more extreme version of that <clears throat> um, is dissociating or numbing, okay? So we have kind of, ranges and all these things. Another general bucket of adaptations is those of us who really move toward. So under pressure, we like engage, we want to talk it out, we want to get closer, right? Even if it's a challenging situation, we might move toward it to try to calm it down or to work it out or to stay connected. It's almost like we'll choose connection sometimes over safety, right? So move toward, that's another bucket of condition tendency, right? The first one, I'm gonna back it up and move away. The second one is I'm just gonna keep moving toward over and over again and try to work it out, okay? A third general bucket, <clears throat> is uh, what we would call move against. 
So that means if I struggle, if I fight, I feel more connected or I feel more safe, right? So these can sometimes be, well, either us or the people in our families or the people at our workplace, where they seem to do, to feel more settled inside of discord. Or they might be the one that initiate the fight over and over again, but there's something about it that actually is getting taken care of for them, okay? We all have conditioned tendencies. We all have adapted to try to navigate, right? Our early experiences and try to navigate our families and try to navigate our communities and our world. We all have adaptations. Adaptations aren't in and of themselves bad. They're just, actually they're awesome because they help us keep going. <laughs> But what happens is once an adaptation generalizes, it's very hard not to do it, particularly under any kind of stress. That's where the breakdown starts, is in a situation where I might need to have a boundary, but my adaptation kicks in and the only thing I can do is keep moving toward, moving toward, moving toward, when actually what's needed is a boundary and a separation. Or if we flip it, <clears throat> under enough pressure, if you're kind of one who tends to get away from, if what would serve the situation is connecting and kind of hanging in through the heat, but what your automatic adaptation is that's been generalized is I'm out, right? So there comes a point where our generalized adaptations, our conditioned tendencies start to create breakdowns in our visions and what we want to make happen in the world and our relationships and our parenting but we keep doing the same thing under pressure and it is so understandable it's so understandable we can't not do that that's actually how our somas are built yeah and if we think kind of about the rest of the animal world it's great to learn about danger quickly to generalize our strategy and to keep doing it over and over again, because it, it can increase our rate of survival. Um, but then as we all know, there's places it just really, really doesn't work, right? A condition tendency or an adaptation is no longer taking in current time information and responding to it. It is feeling a stimuli and going, oh, I know that thing and moving to this automatic response. And we also, as you all probably know, we can't think our way out of it, right? If we could think our way out of it, we would have done that already. <laughs> yeah, because all of us are smart people. <laughs>